to start things off, our first presenter is Lisa Bala, who works at the Snow and Ice, a National Snow and Ice Data Center in Boulder, Colorado. And she's going to be talking about how they visualize uh, data from glaciers in Google Earth. Thank you, John. As John mentioned, I'm going to be talking today about two glacier data sets in particular and how we can view them in Google Earth. And then I'm also going to be talking about GeoServer and the role that GeoServer plays in this project. I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Yipin Wang and Elena Wallace. They have contributed tremendously to this work, and I'd really like to acknowledge their support. Before I get into the talk, I'd like to give you a little bit of background first on the National Snow and Ice Data Center. As John mentioned, we're located in Boulder, Colorado, and we're a big data archive. So we have tons and tons of satellite imagery. We have imagery from submarines, or data, I should say, from submarines, and we also have photo collections. We manage and disseminate different Snow and Ice Data Center, and we're funded primarily by NASA, NOAA, and the NSF. The work that I'm going to be talking today about today is funded by NOAA's National Geophysical Data Center. I should say that at the National Snow and Ice Data Center, most people come to our website looking for data. However, if they're not looking for data, the, most, the second most popular search term that they're looking for is information on glaciers. So I'm going to be talking today about two different glacier data sets, the Glacier Photograph Collection and the World Glacier Inventory. I'm going to be showing how you can visualize them in Google Earth, and I'm going to use GeoServer to do this. And then at the very end, I'm going to be talking about our NSIDC virtual globe site. We have a glacier photograph collection where we have glaciers that extend back to the 1880s, and then we have information up to 2005. This is a really neat collection because it was donated to NSIDC in the... Um, by William Field back in the 1970s. And coverage primarily includes Alaskan and Greenland glaciers, although we do have limited coverage in other areas such as Canada, Europe, New Zealand, and Peru. This data set is actually really important. It's one of our most popular data sets at NSIDC. We have, it's doubled in size this year since January of 2008, and with many contributions by the USGS Ice and Climate Project, with many contributions from Austin Post. We now have over 10,000 glacier photographs online. And this is a whole project with accessibility because when we received this huge collection from William Field a while ago, he gave us tons and tons of glacier photographs, but we had the photographic prints. In order to actually view this information, you had to go to Boulder, Colorado, and you had to go into our analog archives room, and you could flip through all of the various different photographs which is great. However, thanks to NOAA's Climate Database Modernization Program, we have digitized a lot of these photographs, and now they're available online. We do have several um, thousand glaciers that are not, or prints that are not available online yet, but we are working with NOAA's CDMP program to get this funded and made available online. This just gives you an example of a Rapaho Glacier. In 1912, 1966, and in 2004. And you can kind of see how the glaciers have, how this particular glacier has retreated over time. A subset of our collection is a set of repeat photographs where a photographer will go to an exact location and specifically try and repeat a photograph from the past. So, for example, this is Holgate Glacier in Alaska taken in July of 1909 and then taken again by Bruce Molnia in August of 2004. And what's really neat about this is that you can visually see some of the retreat that's happened with various glaciers over time. And this is really what the public are interested in. Everyone is coming to our site looking for glaciers. And so we have these photos now online. And we're, we've also created several different KML files so that you can zoom into Google Earth. You can go to Alaska, look at the different place marks. You click on a place mark, and it pops up information in Google Earth. What's also important about the Google Earth work that we've done is that we have information we have our metadata associated with these glacier photographs. So you don't just have glacier photographs without any context. We have information about each specific glacier photograph in our collection. And this is really the most important 
part, I think, because you can view the photos, which are obviously very interesting, but without the metadata, you don't really know what you're looking at, and it's not very useful. I just talked about the glacier photograph collection, but the second data set I'm going to talk about is our World Glacier Inventory data set. So while the glacier photos are actually photographs, this is more raw data and statistics about glaciers. This collection has over 100,000 glaciers, and it's a snapshot in time. So we have information such as the latitude and longitude of the glacier, the total area, the mean depth, and so on. Our objective, our objective was to make this information accessible through Google Earth. Now, with the glacier photograph collection, we have static KML files. And when the glacier photograph collection is updated, we have to update our KML files to make sure that they are in sync. With the World Glacier Inventory, it, it was just too large to do this. We have over 100,000 records. If we created a KML file, it would be thousands and thousands of pages long, and it would probably crash if you tried to open it in Google Earth. So we had to come up with some kind of solution, and we wanted it to be a dynamic solution because every time we update the World Glacier Inventory, we don't want to actually go in and manually update the KML file. We want this to be done automatically. So our solution was to use GeoServer for this, which will dynamically request area-specific information. So to get our World Glacier Inventory from, the, from our one database into KML, we're using GeoServer. If you're not familiar with GeoServer, here's a diagram that kind of shows you the different inputs that you can use. So we have inputs for the World Glacier. I'm using the World Glacier Inventory for this. And then you can have different output op options. And what's nice about GeoServer is that it automatically creates these output options for you. We are using PostGIS um, as our input. So we've loaded all of our World Glacier Inventory data into this database, and then we're connecting it to GeoServer, and then GeoServer automatically creates this KML output for us. Here's a quick view from Google Earth of our World Glacier Inventory, and I've kind of zoomed in on Europe. I've added a little place mark here for the overview to give you context for what we're looking at. And then we have little red arrows, and each red arrow represents a glacier in our World Glacier Inventory. You can zoom in a little bit and zoom in a little bit more. And you can click on one of these icons, and it gives you information about the data. And this is pulled dynamically from the database. So the closer you zoom in, it's recalculating, oh, I'm only interested in this particular region. I'm only going to return these results to you through GeoServer. And I have formatted this so that you can go back to our documentation to get information on the metadata. All of the field names I've included here, along with all of their values. And for example, let's say you don't know what one of the country codes means. You don't know what CH means. You can click on our documentation, and it has information on what all the country codes mean, and that helps you better understand the data. Michael Jones of Google spoke last night at the AGU conference here in San Francisco. And he was talking about having scientists uh, communicate the results and distribute their data. And he mentioned that a lot of scientists actually, you know, will distribute their data and they'll put it online, but sometimes they don't have any information, they don't have any column headers. So you can look at the data, but it's not going to make any sense to you because you don't know what the values mean, you don't even know what the headers are. That's analogous to the output that you'll get using GeoServer if you don't use KML templates and style layer descriptors. So in this example here, I have used a KML template and a styled layer descriptor. Because if I don't, you're going to get this long table with records from the database, and it, it, it's not going to really make any sense to you. For example, topographic scale in the database might have a field name of topo underscore scale. And you might not know what that means, and it just gives you this long output. So I have formatted it to make it a little bit easier to understand in Google Earth. At the heart of this, of course, is GeoServer. And the key with GeoServer is interoperability. So you can take data from various different sources, you can integrate it into GeoServer, and then you can use this through several different web mapping applications. It supports OGC standards, and you can share and edit geospatial data. 
And what I like about GeoServer is that it's GUI driven. You don't have to be a programmer in order to be able to use GeoServer. The once GeoServer is up and running, you can load your data into GeoServer and it automatically creates the KML files for you. And the GUI is very intuitive. Another thing I should note is that a lot of times when you think of open source software, you think, oh, well, it might not be very well documented. I must say that I'm quite impressed with the documentation for GeoServer. Several, the open source community has done a really good job of putting information together about GeoServer. And whenever I have questions, I resort back to the documentation and I usually find the answers that I'm looking for. This is an example of the GeoServer main page. And from the main page, I've clicked on one of the layers. This is the World Glacier Inventory layer, and I'm clicking on KML here. This, this page kind of lists all the layers that you see along with all of the outputs. You can also go in and make configuration changes. So you can go to data and feature types, and you can get the World Glacier Inventory data that you've just loaded, and you can change the style. Say, for example, you don't like the red arrows that I have, and you want to have a little white snowflake instead. You can create your own style layer descriptor, and it's pretty easy. You just um, change the style on this web page, hit apply and save, and it's done for you. So this is an outreach project that we're working on. And so we wanted to take the data from GeoServer and put it into Google Earth. And we do this, obviously, through KML. And since this is auto -gen automatically generated, it makes it really nice. Um, as I mentioned, the user output is not very friendly at first, but you can use templates and style layer descriptors and make it much nicer. Here's an example of style layer descriptor. This is just a little piece of code that I took out of it. But basically, I've highlighted that you can put this snowflake underscore thumb dot gif file in here, and it, and you have to save this file in GeoServer, but then everything is snowflakes. Every single glacier will be a snowflake instead of a red arrow like I have it. Here's an example KML template that I've created. This is just part of it, but you can see actually that part of the values in here, for example, example, glacier underscore num dot value. That's pulling information dynamically from the database. And as you can see, I'm pretty much using HTML tags here. So I don't have to know how to program. I don't have to know how to create a KML file. I just have to know how to edit this template and all of the information is available through the GeoServer website. Next, I want to show you our virtual globe site. This is a site that we have at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. And this has all of our Google Earth files all in one place. You can see on the left-hand side, we have a little snapshot image of the file. And then we also have the KML files that you can download along with the data source so that you can actually go to the data source and find out more information about this. I should note that every file on this page has been peer reviewed. We've set up a peer review process for all of our KML files. Because our main goal is we want to create KML files, but we don't want to make them unusable. We want to make KML files that are of high quality. And so at least three people have viewed every single file that we've put on this website. And our goal, obviously, is for outreach because we want to make them easier and more accessible to a broader audience. You can see the glaciers file that I spoke about earlier. That's right here. You can download that. And if you look through this website, you will not find the World Glacier Inventory file that I spoke about earlier. Why is that? That's because it's on our Google Earth Technical Experiments page. So we're really trying to foster innovation at NSIDC. And by doing this, we want to be able to have a way to get files out to the public that have not been peer reviewed, but that are more innovative. So if you look on this page, the World Glacier Inventory file that I was talking about is here. And this will go through our peer review process. It just has not yet. 
But this lists various files that we've been experimenting with. So if you're wondering what we've been up to lately, you can go to this site and take a look at some of the files that we have been working on. This concludes my presentation. As I mentioned, this is an outreach initiative to reach a broad audience. We really want to get our data out there. We want more people to use it. And we want to make it as easy to use as possible. A lot of people like using Google Earth, which is why I've shown this, uh, I've showed Google Earth in this presentation. But KML is an open standard. So you can view KML on other uh, virtual globes, such as Microsoft's Virtual Earth. GeoServer helps serve data through Google Earth and its open source software, which is why we have selected Google or GeoServer. And users can view the Glacier data sets in a spatial environment. Feel free to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Yes. Okay. Great, thank you. I will just repeat what he said. Uh, he had more of a comment more, rather than a question. He's a teacher, and he uses, he's used our sea ice images in some of the classes that he has taught, and he's found them useful, and he thanked us. Yes? Um, does uh, GeoServer support export to photo overlay? That's a good question. I don't know. I should note, though, that GeoServer does, you can create, you can add on to GeoServer. So if, you, if it's not available in GeoServer, you can program it and make it do that. Okay, thank you.